Section Two of the Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Two. Each bought her own ticket at the entrance to Weasel Park, and each, as she laid her half dollar down, was distinctly aware of how many pieces of fancy starch were represented by the coin. It was too early for the crowd, but bricklayers and their families, laden with huge lunch baskets and armfuls of babies, were already going in, a healthy, husky race of workmen, well paid and robustly fed, and with them here and there, undisguised by their decent American clothing, smaller in bulk and stature, weazened, not alone by age, but by the pinch of lean years and early hardship, were grandfathers and mothers who had patently first seen the light of day on old Irish soil. Their faces showed content and pride as they limped along with this lusty progeny of theirs that had fed on better food. Not with these did Mary and Saxon belong. They knew them not, had no acquaintances among them. It did not matter whether the festival were Irish, German, or Slavovian. Whether the picnic was the bricklayers, the brewers, or the butchers, they, the girls, were of the dancing crowd that swelled by a certain constant percentage the gate receipts of all the picnics. They strolled about among the booths where peanuts were grinding and popcorn was roasting in preparation for the day, and went on and inspected the dance floor of the pavilion. Saxon, clinging to an imaginary partner, essayed a few steps of the dip waltz. Mary clapped her hands. My, she cried, you're just swell, and them stockings is peaches. Saxon smiled with appreciation, pointed out her foot, velvet slippered with high Cuban heels, and slightly lifted the tight black skirt, exposing a trim ankle and delicate swell of calf, the white flesh gleaming through the thinnest and flimsiest of fifty-cent black silk stockings. She was slender, not tall, yet the dew round lines of womanhood were hers. On her white shirtwaist was a pleated jabot of cheap lace caught with a large novelty pin of imitation coral. Over the shirtwaist was a natty jacket, elbowed sleeved, and to the elbows she wore gloves of imitation suede. The one essentially natural touch about her appearance was the few curls, stranger to curling irons, that escaped from under the little naughty hat of black velvet, pulled low over the eyes. Mary's dark eyes flashed with joy at the sight, and with a swift little run she caught the other girl in her arms and kissed her in a breast-crushing embrace. She released her, blushing at her own extravagance. You look good to me, she cried in extenuation. If I was a man, I couldn't keep my hands off you. I'd eat you. I sure would. They went out of the pavilion hand in hand, and on through the sunshine they strolled, swinging hands gaily, reacting exuberantly from the week of deadening toil. They hung over the railing of the bear pit, shivering at the huge and lonely denizen and passed quickly on to ten minutes of laughter at the monkey cage. Crossing the grounds, they looked down into the little racetrack on the bed of a natural amphitheater where the early afternoon games were to take place. After that, they explored the woods, threaded by countless paths ever opening out in new surprises of green, painted, rustic tables and benches in leafy nooks, many of which were already preempted by family parties. On a grassy slope, trees surrounded, they spread a newspaper and sat down on the short grass, already tawny dry, under the California sun. Half were they minded to do this because of the grateful indolence after six days of insistent motion, half in conservation for the hours of dancing to come. Bert Wanhope will be sure to come, Mary chattered, and he said he was going to bring Billy Roberts. 
Big Bill, all the fellows call him. He's just a big boy, but he's awfully tough. He's a prize fighter, and all the girls run after him. I'm afraid of him. He ain't quick in talking. He's more like that big bear we saw. Ruff, ruff. Bite your head off, just like that. He ain't really a prize fighter. He's a teamster, belongs to the Union. Drives for Cobley and Morrison. But sometimes he fights in the clubs. Most of the fellows are scared of him. He's got a bad temper, and he just as soon hit a fellow as eat, just like that. You won't like him, but he's a swell dancer. He's heavy, you know, and he just slides and glides around. You want to have a dance with him anyway. He's a good spender, too. Never pinches, but my, he's got one temper. The talk wandered on, a monologue on Mary's part that centered always on Bert Wanhope. You and he are pretty thick, Saxon ventured. I'd marry him tomorrow, Mary flashed out impulsively. Then her face went bleakly forlorn, hard, almost in its helpless pathos. Only, he never asks me. He's... Her pause was broken by sudden passion. You watch out for him, Saxon. If he ever comes fooling around you, he's no good. Just the same, I'd marry him tomorrow. He'll never get me any other way. Her mouth opened, but instead of speaking, she drew a long sigh. It's a funny world, ain't it, she added. More like a scream. And all the stars are worlds, too. I wonder where God hides. Bert Wanhope says there ain't no God, but he's just terrible. He says the most terrible things. I believe in God. Don't you? What do you think about God, Saxon? Saxon shrugged her shoulders and laughed. But if we do wrong, we get ours, don't we, Mary persisted. That's what they all say, except Bert. He says he don't care what he does. He'll never get his, because when he dies, he's dead. And when he's dead, he'd like to see anyone put anything across on him that would wake him up. Ain't he terrible, though? But it's all so funny. Sometimes I get scared when I think God's keeping an eye on me all the time. Do you think he knows what I'm saying now? What do you think he looks like, anyway? I don't know, Saxon answered. He's just a funny proposition. Oh, the other gasped. He is just the same. From what all people say of him, Saxon went on stoutly, my brother thinks he looks like Abraham Lincoln. Sarah thinks he has whiskers. And I never think of him with his hair parted, Mary confessed, daring the thought and shivering with apprehension. He just couldn't have his hair parted. That would be funny. You know that little wrinkly Mexican that sells wire puzzles? Saxon queried. Well, God somehow always reminds me of him. Mary laughed outright. Now that is funny. I never thought of him like that. How do you make it out? Well, just like the little Mexican, he seems to spend his time peddling puzzles. He passes a puzzle out to everybody, and they spend all their lives trying to work it out. They all get stuck. I can't work mine out. I don't know where to start. And look at the puzzle he passed Sarah. And she's part of Tom's puzzle, and she only makes his worse. And they all, and everybody I know, you too, are part of my puzzle. Maybe the puzzles is all right, Mary considered. But God don't look like that yellow little greaser. That I won't fall for. God don't look like anybody. Do you remember on the wall at the Salvation Army? It says, God is a spirit. That's another one of his puzzles, I guess, because nobody knows what a spirit looks like. That's right, too, Mary shuddered, with reminiscent fear. Whenever I try to think of God as a spirit, I see Hen Miller, all wrapped up in a sheet and running us girls. We didn't know and it scared the life out of us. Little Maggie Murphy fainted dead away, and Beatrice Peralta fell and scratched her face horrible. When I think of a spirit, all I can see is a white sheet running in the dark. Just the same, God don't look like a Mexican, and he don't wear his hair parted. A strain of music from the dancing pavilion brought both girls scrambling to their feet. 
We can get a couple of dances in before we eat, Mary proposed, and then it'll be afternoon and all the fellows will be here. Most of them are pinchers. That's why they don't come early, so as to get out of taking the girls to dinner. But Bert's free with his money, and so is Billy. If we can beat the other girls to it, they'll take us to the restaurant. Come on, hurry, Saxon. There were few couples on the floor when they arrived at the pavilion, and the two girls essayed the first waltz together. There's Bert now, Saxon whispered, as they came around the second time. Don't take any notice of them, Mary whispered back. We'll just keep on going. They needn't think we're chasing after them. But Saxon noted the heightened color in the other's cheek and felt her quicker breathing. Did you see that other one, Mary asked, as she backed Saxon in a long slide across the far end of the pavilion. That was Billy Roberts. Bert said he'd come. He'll take you to dinner, and Bert will take me. It's going to be a swell day, you'll see. My, I only wish the music will hold out till we can get back to the other end. Down the floor they danced, on man-trapping and dinner-getting intent. Two fresh young things that undeniably danced well and that were delightfully surprised when the music stranded them perilously near to their desire. Bert and Mary addressed each other by their given names, but to Saxon, Bert was Mr. Wanhope, though he called her by her first name. The only introduction was of Saxon and Billy Roberts. Mary carried it off with a flurry of nervous carelessness. Mr. Robert, Miss Brown, she's my best friend. Her first name's Saxon. Ain't it a scream of a name? Sounds good to me, Billy retorted, hat off and hand extended. Pleased to meet you, Miss Brown. As their hands clasped and she felt the teamster's calluses on his palm, her quick eyes saw a score of things. About all that he saw was her eyes, and then it was with a vague impression that they were blue. Not till later in the day did he realize that they were gray. She, on the contrary, saw his eyes as they really were, deep blue, wide, and handsome in a sullen, boyish way. She saw that they were straight-looking, and she liked them, as she had liked the glimpse she had caught of his hand, and as she liked the contact of his hand itself. Then, too, but not sharply, she had perceived the short, square-set nose, the rosiness of cheek, and the firm, short upper lip. Where delight centered her flash of gaze on the well-modeled, large, clean mouth, where red lips smiled clear of the white, enviable teeth. A boy, a great big man-boy, was her thought, and as they smiled at each other, and their hands slipped apart, she was startled by a glimpse of his hair, short and crisp and sandy, hinting almost of palest gold, save that it was too flaxen to hint of gold at all. So blond was he, that she was reminded of stage types she had seen, such as Ole Olson and Jan Janssen. But there resemblance ceased. It was a matter of color only, for the eyes were dark-lashed and browed, and were cloudy with temperament rather than staring a child gaze of wonder, and the suit of smooth brown cloth had been made by a tailor. Saxon appraised the suit on the instant, and her secret judgment was not a cent less than fifty dollars. Further, he had none of the awkwardness of the Scandinavian immigrant. On the contrary, he was one of those rare individuals that radiate muscular grace through the ungraceful man-garments of civilization. Every movement was supple, slow, and apparently considered. This she did not see or analyze. She saw only a clothed man with grace of carriage and movement. She felt, rather than perceived, the calm and certitude of all the muscular play of him, and she felt, too, the promise of easement and rest that was especially grateful and craved for by one who had incessantly for six days and at top speed ironed fancy starch. As the touch of his hand had been good, 
So, to her, the subtler feel of all of him, body and mind, was good. As he took her program and skirmished and joked after the way of young men, she realized the immediacy of delight she had taken in him. Never in her life had she been so affected by any man. She wondered to herself, is this the man? He danced beautifully. The joy was hers that good dancers take when they have found a good dancer for a partner. The grace of those slow-moving certain muscles of his accorded perfectly with the rhythm of the music. There was never doubt, never a betrayal of indecision. She glanced at Bert, dancing tough with Mary, carooming down the long floor with more than one collision with the increasing couples. Graceful himself in his slender, tall, lean-stomached way, Bert was accounted a good dancer, yet Saxon did not remember ever having danced with him with keen pleasure. Just a hit of a jerk spoiled his dancing, a jerk that did not occur usually, but that always impended. There was something spasmodic in his mind. He was too quick, or he continually threatened to be too quick. He always seemed just on the verge of overrunning the time. It was disquieting. He made for unrest. You're a dream of a dancer, Billy Roberts was saying. I've heard lots of the fellows talk about your dancing. I love it, she answered. But from the way she said it, he sensed her reluctance to speak and danced on in silence. While she, warmed with the appreciation of a woman for gentle consideration. Gentle consideration was a thing rarely encountered in the life she lived. Is this the man? She remembered Mary's, I'd marry him tomorrow, and caught herself speculating on marrying Billy Roberts by the next day, if he asked her. With eyes that dreamily desired to close, she moved on in the arms of this masterful, guiding pressure. A prize fighter. She experienced a thrill of wickedness as she thought of what Sarah would say, could she see her now. Only he wasn't a prize fighter, but a teamster. Came an abrupt lengthening of step. The guiding pressure grew more compelling, and she was caught up and carried along, though her velvet-shod feet never left the floor. Then came the sudden control down to the shorter step again, and she felt herself being held slightly from him so that he might look into her face and laugh with her in joy at the exploit. At the end, as the band slowed in the last bars, they too slowed their dance, fading with the music in a lengthening glide that ceased with the last lingering tone. We're sure cut out for each other when it comes to dancing, he said, as they made their way to rejoin the other couple. It was a dream, she replied. So low was her voice that he bent to hear, and saw the flush in her cheeks that seemed to communicate to her eyes, which were softly warm and sensuous. He took the program from her and gravely and gigantically wrote his name across all the length of it. And now it's no good, he dared. Ain't no need for it. He tore it across and tossed it aside. Me for you, Saxon, for the next was Bert's greeting as they came up. You take Mary for the next whirl, Bill. Nothing doing, Bo, was the retort. Me and Saxon's framed up to last the day. Watch out for him, Saxon, Mary warned facetiously. He's liable to get a crush on you. I guess I know a good thing when I see it, Billy responded gallantly. And so do I, Saxon aided and abetted. I'd have known you if I'd seen you in the dark, Billy added. Mary regarded them with mock alarm, and Bert said good-naturedly, All I got to say is you ain't wasting any time getting together. Just the same, if you could spare a few minutes from each other after a couple of more whirls, Mary and me be complimented to have your presence at dinner. Just like that, chimed Mary. Quit your kidding, Billy laughed back, turning his head to look into Saxon's eyes. Don't listen to him. They're grouched because they got to dance together. Bert's a rotten dancer, and Mary ain't so much. Come on, there she goes. 
See you after two more dances. End of section two.